so hi everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Northern Gothic. As usual, I'm Dr. Sam Hurst. You can contact me at, at RomGothSam or uh, the hashtag RomGothSam, uh, Romancing the Gothic, sorry. Um, and we're going to be talking today about the idea of the Northern Gothic, how we might want to define it, how we might want to interact with it, and looking at this idea of the North as a Gothic space. Um, and the North there is relatively nebulous and the boundaries of the North tend to change based on who is writing about the North. Generally speaking, anything above Yorkshire seems to fall into the North as a category um, uh, for most writers, but you'll also get obviously sort of like the industrial belt of uh, sort of Manchester also and Lancashire um, and Liverpool even um, being counted in the North in um, sort of uh, different people's accounts. So I thought we'd start with a clip that I already shared today, but just in case anybody didn't see it, um, I think this is a good introduction to kind of the North as it exists in the 19th century imaginary. So um, I'm going to just play this clip quickly, hopefully. We'll see if it works. Tell me, um, somebody put your microphone and tell me if there's a problem with sound. So that was obviously a brief clip from um, the BBC version of North and South, uh, starring Richard Armitage. And it's the impression of the Southern heroine of the North of England, sort of about a third of the way through the TV series and a part of the way through the novel. Um, and this sense of it as a, a space that is um, just fundamentally different from her other experiences of England, which is sort of England there is coded as the south of England. Um, and you have this idea of it as this industrial space, as this cruel, unfeeling, God abandoned space. And then, of course, that declaration that she's seen hell, that effectively the north of England is hell, the industrialized north, particularly here. Um, you also have, and somebody pointed this out on Twitter, that you basically have. Uh, you know, Mr. Thornton there appearing as a satanic figure, which I think is a really interesting read, but uh, we'll think about that later. Okay, how do I go to the next slide? I want to go on to the next slide. Okay, cool, thank you. So we have this sort of conception of the North of England as this other space. And it's really a conception that is evident right from the beginning of the roots of the Gothic as well. And we often concentrate on, we often concentrate on the idea of in the early Gothic, um, the sites of the Gothic being places like Spain and Italy and France. Um, now that's sometimes true, but not universally true. There's also quite a lot of Gothic set in places like Scotland, Ireland and Wales and other spaces within the United Kingdom, including sort of references quite frequently to the North. So this uh, is the first of the Gothic novels, obviously the Castle of Otranto, 1764. And even right from the beginning, we can see this kind of conception of an other North um, because the, the, the sort of framing narrative that this is a found document um, contains the following information, that the following work was found in the library of an ancient Catholic family in the north of England. So this attachment of this old relic, this medieval anachronism, connected with the north, and also we're going to talk about that, that little uh, connection there to Catholicism in the north later on. Um, another example of this connection between the early Gothic and the north is the situating in the Old English Baron by Clara Reeve of the villain. So the villain, Sir Walter, moves further north and built himself a house in the North Country, as far as Northumberland, I think they call it. So you have this idea of as his villainy increases, his geographical position goes further and further north. Um, and you also have in the sort of, not just the fictional imagination, but the literary critical imagination as well. Ebenezer Rhodes, this is quite a famous uh, document because he draws these connections between Anne Radcliffe and Haddon Hall in Derbyshire. And they're not actually factual connections at all. And I think he's also the place where you, um, I think he is also 
the person who spreads the rumor that she spent her last days um, insane in Haddon Hall. But so he says, Mrs. Anne Radcliffe, who is a native of Derbyshire, often visited Haddon Hall for the purpose of storing her imagination with those romantic ideas and impressing upon it those sublime and awful pictures which she so much delighted to portray. So some of the most gloomy scenery of her mistress of Udolpho was studded within the walls of this ancient structure. So again, we're getting this idea of the North itself, its structures, its spaces as inherently Gothic, just as Gothic as the Italianate castles that appear in its most famous novels. Now, um, Robert Miggle's written about the idea of the geography of Gothic fiction, and he notes that setting is important, but it's not just a case of sort of setting and visuals, but rather the depiction depends on the socio-political and cultural attitude, which informs the writer's view of the geographical or institutional locale in question. So he notes this change from the Gothic settings of the early Gothic from sort of Naples, Madrid, um, France, um, and then the move to Britain in the 19th century Gothic, the move back to the home and back to the sort of wild othered places within Britain. And he says, if the location in question is perceived to harbor unreasonable, uncivilized and unprogressive customs or tendencies, um, then it becomes a Gothic space. So these sort of t three terms are quite key, I think. Um, unreasonable, uncivilized and unprogressive. And it's an interesting uh, sort of dichotomy that we're going to see or an interesting contrast that we're going to see. Because as I mentioned right at the beginning, you're going to see that sort of almost tension between this idea of the North as this industri heavily industrialized modern hellscape and also as this uncivilized, unprogressive, backwards, uh, unreasonable place and sort of anachronistically tied to the past as well. And those two things are often in tension with each other, but also adding to each other to make the North this sort of unhuman space, this uncivilized, unnatural space, um, or if not unnatural, then too natural. <laughs> Both of them are a threat to the civilized, right? Um, to this kind of civilized, normalized human order. Uh, which is, of course, this sort of very particular white middle class southern uh, conception of reality and normality. So there are various features of the North that make it a perfect sort of setting for the Gothic that, uh, that tie into these ideas of unreasonableness and uncivilizedness and unprogressiveness. So first of all, there's the geography of the North of England, and that's the first thing that people leapt to in today's class as well this idea of the space of the North and what it looks like and how that lends itself to the key sort of modes of the Gothic, the sublime, but also this kind of threatening sublimity. So I think this description from the life of Charlotte Bronte is a really good one um, to sort of capture this essence of the Gothic top topography um, of Yorkshire particularly, but also more broadly the North. Wild bleak moors, grand from the ideas of solitude and loneliness which they suggest, or oppressive from the feeling which they give of being pent up by some monotonous and illimitable barrier. So this weird sort of mixed um, experience of these open spaces, it's solitude and loneliness and vulnerability, but it's also oppression. You are sort of weighed down by the very sort of illimitableness of the barriers, by the very kind of uh, endless monotony of the view. And I tried to get a picture that sort of captures that a little bit. Um, obviously as well, we have this conception of the industrial North, um, as we've talked about already. And this um, idea, once again, drawing from Elizabeth Gaskell's biography of Charlotte Bronte, um, this idea of it as a manufacturing place whose uh, sort of state of society and modes of thinking, standards of reference on points of morality, manners, and even politics and religion are different in such a new manufacturing place in the North. They're different to any stately, sleepy, picturesque cathedral town in the South. Um, so this sort of almost fear or um, hesitation 
before uh, this sort of new modernized industrial space where the old rhythms and mores and structures of life are sort of being undone by the new industrial uh, industrial movements these conglomerations these masses of people in one space and how that also changes the kind of social ordering and positioning of people um i thought um i would produce uh, or share another video with you quickly um before we go on um to think about this idea of the north as this particularly sort of bleak hard place as well which is connected to this idea of industrialization and we have obviously in the 19th century with the moves um, to sort of change many of the labor laws we have uh, these sort of surveys such as the ashley mines commission which produced testimonies and evidence about the state of um you know mining villages and mining uh, more broadly in, in the ashley mines commission but also sort of the state of the industrialized towns um uh, of the north and so we have these sort of factual testimonies tying back in to this uh sort of north in the cultural imaginary um, and i thought i'd share this um quick song uh because i think it also produces a really interesting tie between the northern gothic folk music and between the 19th centuries and the sort of current day uh northern gothic trends which often lean back heavily or look back to that earlier period um, and this is the unthanks um, and they're performing a, a short song called the testimony of patience uh, kershaw and the song is based on the actual testimony of a girl working in a mine who testified to the ashley mine commission so they've taken the real testimony from the 19th century and created this sort of haunting gothic folk song so have a listen to this quickly, if we can. It's good of you to ask me, sir, to tell you how I spend the day. I think you see there some of the modern trends within the Northern Gothic, they're giving voice to the North, but we'll come back to that in a second. But hopefully it sort of demonstrates both something about the connection between the modern uh, Gothic and folk, Gothic folk, and also the sort of 19th century realities, but also gives us some kind of insight into how the 19th century North was being seen and understood. Um, so the other sort of uh, factors that feed into this understanding of the North as an othered space, uh, sort of its history, um, its history of various invasions. Now this is going back a long way historically, but we're thinking about sort of this conception of the North as an embattled space quite frequently coming from the, the sea, but also obviously that history of border skirmishes which uh, meant that the sort of the north of England, the very sort of top of the north of England was uh, sort of connected much more both to Scotland and also to um, a sort of surviving militaristic lifestyle. You also have the connection of the north, particularly with revolution and rebellion. Um, and uh, this is sort of quite a good example here. And when you're looking at the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the north particularly is connected with working class agitation. Um, and this is an, an illustration of the Peterloo massacre from 1819, which was when um, a group of protesters, chartists, sort of uh, associated with the chartist movement and the movement for increased uh, suffrage of the working class, um, uh, they were attacked and massacred. Uh, many of them were massacred by uh, the guard, essentially. Um, we also see uh, some, you know, some of the, the really uh, famous working class uh, act, uh, act, action, action that happened in the sort of early uh, 19th century is very much connected still with the North. Um, now, the Luddites, you can see there that the name, they draw the name Luddite from Ned Ludd, uh, from Anthony Lester, who in 1779, so the story goes, broke two frames, but the movement begins more in the Midlands, begins in 1811 in Nottingham, um, but it 
was sort of widespread within the North. You can sort of see it being talked about uh, by writer, by Northern writers, such as Charlotte Bronte. If you've ever read Shirley by Charlotte Bronte, there's quite a lot about the, the, the frame breakers there. So the Luddites were uh, those who were standing against the increased mechanization of the trade and they were frame breakers. So you can see from the picture there, the frame breaking. Um, but and they were also connected not only to sort of destruction of property, but particularly um, sort of within Yorkshire, um, there was this uh, connection with more murderous action. And this was sort of in the Bronte's imaginary, certainly, because she had the murder of the, the Leeds manufacturer, William Horsfall. Um, you also have, and I had to mention this because it's very local, because I am from Todmorden, um, and the plug drawers um, are sort of connected with um, the with Todd Midden. So 1842, it's another working class sort of movement. And you had 20,000 men and women from Todd Midden. It spread to Halifax and Bradford, or Bradford as it's actually called. Um, and it was this, once again, a movement a sort of against changes uh, in uh, factory uh, running and legislation. So you've got this connection of the North with sort of the uncontrolled working class as well, with this, this remnant of a, of a different lifestyle and different times, and also this sense of uh, connection to these invading forces, this sense of um, the, these people up North are slightly different. Um, you also have the sort of religious difference and how that's understood in the North. This is taking us back to Horace Walpole. And you remember that he talked about an old Catholic family in the North of England. Well, you have, um, as you can see from the map there, and although that's the beginning of the 18th century, it gives a fairly good idea of where we are in the 18th and 19th centuries, that Catholicism after the Reformation was largely eradicated from some areas of Britain, but the strongholds that it did have were almost entirely in the north of England. So there's this sense uh, within England itself, um, that's not counting obviously uh, Scotland and the, the, the Scottish uh, areas of kind of recusant Catholicism or Ireland, where it continued to be the dominant religion um, or um, Wales. Um, obviously Ireland isn't part of England or the UK, but um, we are seeing you know, quite a lot of the Gothic that is uh, the Anglophone Gothic in that early period is being produced in England and Ireland. Um, <clears throat> so you have this sort of uh, conception of the North as clinging to these old religious traditions and because of that quite suspicious. But as I've said before, that juxtaposition of the, the old and the anachronistic and the new, because um, the North was also known <laughs> for its connection with dissenting movements. Um, this is this is a picture from the 17th century, but it, it's a fun one of, of some of the different uh, dissenting groups that you find in the 17th century. Um, people like um, the Shakers, the Soul Sleepers, Arminians and Arians, fairly, fairly dull there, uh, <laughs> Libertines, all sorts of different dissenting groups. Um, and you, you find that particular areas of the north of England were particularly uh, sort of apt to take on these dissenting identities. And you do get a sort of um, an overlap between the spread of dissent and dissenting strongholds and the spread of industry. So um, if you're looking at places like the Calder Valley where I live, which had a sort of massive increase in industry in the 19th century, uh, it was rife, rife with different dissenting denominations down here um, and was sort of a key stomping ground of John Wesley. So. We've looked at all of those ways in which um, the North became sort of understood or was imagined as uncivilized or uh, it was imagined as Gothic, essentially. Uncivilized, uncontrollable, strange. Um, and you see this then, this idea of the North cropping up in the Gothic, particularly when we see in the Victorian period, the move away from an emphasis on a European set Gothic to an English set Gothic, or more broadly to a UK and Ireland set Gothic. Um, but um, one of the sort of most interesting examples, the first example we're going to look at today is Elizabeth Gaskell. I'm gonna use a factional, a factual example of hers and a fictional one. I think 
although she is based in Manchester and I think comes from Cheshire, she imagines this sort of further north, Yorkshire and upwards, even Lancashire, as being still this very othered place. Now for her, there's also an industrial rural divide, I think, to some extent, or industrial city rural divide, but she's still producing narratives of a sort of othered Gothic North more generally. And you can see this really, really clearly in her biography of Charlotte Bronte, which I love. I think it's hilarious. Um, so for a right understanding of the life of my dear friend, Charlotte Bronte, it appears to me more necessary in her case than in most others that the reader should be made acquainted with the peculiar forms of population and society amidst which her earliest years were passed and from which both her own and her sister's first impressions of human life must have been received. I shall endeavour, therefore, before proceeding further with my work, to present some idea of the character of the people of Haworth and the surrounding districts. So you might think, you know, oh, the peculiar forms of population and society. Or did she grow up in some kind of cult? No, no, literally just Yorkshire. She's just describing Yorkshire. And she, in her biography of Charlotte Bronte, is trying to recreate the memory of Charlotte Bronte. And she's trying to sort of create this sense of an excuse for why she didn't fit into the societal norms. And we've, we've got to excuse her because she grew up in Yorkshire. So she uses this idea of the other North to perform a kind of geographical apologetics. And I think you can see in her fictional work as well, this kind of lingering sense of an othered Gothic North. And so I've got a little passage here. I'm going to read it and I'm going to ask you for your ideas, what you can draw out from this that you think ties into this sense of the North or Yorkshire more broadly as an othered place and as a Gothic place. So um, the old nurse's tale is the story of a nurse um, and her young charge who have to move to a house in the sort of the barren north um, and the house is haunted and it ends up being very very dangerous for the little girl so without any spoilers uh, sort of that's the basic story and this is the first time that the nurse and the child come to that house in the north I think you can read this description really the house is standing as a sort of avatar of the north which then is becoming a sort of avatar of its own otherness. So we'll see what you mean, see what kind of elements of this othered Gothic North you can draw out from this depiction. So the road went up about two miles and then we saw a great and stately house with many trees close around it, so close that in some places their branches dragged against the walls when the wind blew and some hung broken down for no one seemed to take much charge of the place to lock the wood or to keep the moss covered carriageway in order. Only in front of the house all was clear. The great oval drive was without a weed, and neither tree nor creeper was allowed to grow over the long, many-windowed front, at both sides of which a wing projected, which were the ends of the other side fronts. For the house, although it was so desolate, was even grander than I expected. Behind it rose the fells, which seemed unenclosed and bare enough. On the left of the house, as you stood facing it, was a little old-fashioned flower garden, as I found out afterwards. The door opened out upon it from the west front. It had been scooped out of the thick, dark wood for some old Lady, lady Furnival, but the branches of the great forest trees had grown and overshadowed it again, and there were very few flowers that would live there at that time. Um, so there are quite a lot of features from this that tie back to the Gothic North. I think the sense of the unenclosed and bare space, both threatening and enticing at the same time, the wood that has crept back over the attempts to sort of civilize it. There's this recurrence from the past, the sense of an anachronistic return potentially. And you also have this sense of the, the sort of the crumblingness of the house the way in which this is not a cared for and curated space, particularly, um, which is also one of the ideas of the North and to some extent, the myth of the North, you know, there's the sort of the famous idea about the Moors, isn't there? This idea of the Moors as this untamed landscape. And yet the Moors are actually a manufactured landscape and, you know, like the heather burning, etc., is a massive part of, or the, the clearance burning is a massive part of maintaining the Moors. Um, so we've had a look at this kind of writing the North almost from without to some extent. Um, and we'll quickly look at writing or speaking the North from within and, and what kind of difference that perhaps makes. So you've seen this idea of this bare, threatening, 
terrifying, run down, anachronistically stuck in the past North. And this is the Brontes um, version. Now, obviously the speaker here is a Southerner. Um, um, so there's quite a sort of a couple of layers of irony going on here. You have a Northern voice representing what a Southern voice thinks of the North. This is certainly a beautiful country. In all England, I do not believe that I could have fixed on a situation so completely removed from the stir of society. A perfect misanthrope's heaven. And Mr. Heathcliff and I are such a suitable pair to divide the desolation between us. Now, um, this narrator is foolish and has misunderstood almost everything about the situation. Um, so you do have, I think here, a fairly satirical glance at how Southerners represent the North, but you can see more of a sort of Northern voice coming through in the second passage. So pure bracing ventilation they must have up there at all times indeed. One may guess the power of the North wind blowing over the edge by the excessive slant of a few stunted firs at the end of the house, and by a range of gaunt thorns, all stretching their limbs one way as if craving alms of the sun. Happily, the architect had foresight to build it strong. The narrow windows are deeply set in the wall and the corners defended with large jutting stones. So we chatted a little bit about this idea in the Gaskell text that only certain people can live in the North. Um, you know, only a few flowers can survive. And I think we have that idea repeated in Wuthering Heights, but here it's given a slightly more positive, potentially positive turn. Um, this is a place, you know, where there's power and strength, but this is a place where you have to be a certain type of person to be able to survive it. But that is kind of positively viewed in a way. Um, so the last and the main example that I'm going to look at, because this is one of my favourite stories, and I think it's really quite funny, is a story by Robert Murray Gilchrist, who is, I maintain, a Yorkshire writer, but is often talked about as a Derbyshire writer because he was born in Sheffield, but lived most of his life in Homesfield. He's, uh, we've had a talk on him by uh, Dan Peterson um, in the Romance in the Gothic course, and he's also um, editing a collection of Robert Murray Gilchrist tales from the British Library at the moment. Um, and, but still, Robert Murray Gilchrist isn't that well known, but he was prolific and fairly popular in his time. He produced 22 novels, mostly sensation fiction, a play, over 100 short stories, um, and four non-fiction books. So he wrote a lot of topographical texts. So his first published work was Passion the Plaything, which you can see as a sort of sensation novel there. The Gothic story collection was A Stone Dragon. And he also wrote um, regional collections, A Peakland Faggot, which if you are not familiar with the term, um, is used either for a bundle of wood or a type of food in the north of England. Um, and topographical texts, you can see are concentrated on different areas of the north. So you've got the Peak District in Derbyshire and the Pennines, etc. You've got uh, North Yorkshire with Ripon and Harrogate, and again, sort of East North Yorkshire with Scarborough and neighbourhood. So this is a man who has lived his whole life in the North and is particularly interested in depictions of the North. And what I'm going to argue for in the story A Night on the Moor is that what he essentially does is recreate a nebulous North in his text by using geographical markers, which we can tie two specific locations in the north of England, but not come up with one single um, sort of unified location. So he talks about the very heart of the Peak Country, which presumably means Derbyshire, but you could also think about it as the Yorkshire Dales, the reference to the three peaks. There's a three peaks in Yorkshire, there's a three peaks in Derbyshire. He references a Druid Circle, which could refer to the nine ladies in the peaks, or it could refer to the Druid Circle in the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, Calton Lodge, um, seems to refer to a location in the Yorkshire Dales, Offerton Hall to one in Derbyshire, Barley Clough to one in Lancashire and Wormsworth or Wormsworth to one in South Yorkshire. So he uses this sort of geographical mapping to create a nebulous northern location. Um, the story of the night on the moor is that of a, I'll pop this up for you to be viewing while I'm telling the story, um, is the story of a young man who is a southerner, has gone on a break to the north and is going out sort of shooting for the day, gets lost on the moors because he's got no idea what he's doing, ends up taking shelter in a shepherd's cabin and meeting there a beautiful woman. And she invites him back to her house and she wants to play a trick on her husband, who she says is, you know, 
over possessive and too jealous and a bit uh, he's cramping her style basically and so she says you know let's pretend when he comes in um, and he's going to come in he's going to hide he's going to spy on us so let's pretend that we are lovers and that this is a, an assignation and he's like yeah okay pretty lady um, and so they go through with it he gets too into it because she really does love her husband she's just wanting to play around and make him more jealous or to to punish him for his jealousy um, and our protagonist gives her a kiss um, this leads to a scene between him and her and this leads to a scene between the husband and wife who end up running off onto the moors and that's the last he sees of them then he wakes the next day not as he expected anywhere near this hall but rather in the ruins of an old building and he finds out that the people he had met before had died over a century before um, and that the man had murdered his wife through jealousy so there's an interesting sort of early example of a time loop potentially there going on um, but why have i chosen this to talk about um, sort of as a Gothic North example from writing within the Gothic, with it within the Gothic North about the Gothic North. Well, because I think it counts as a Gothic Northern tale, it uses a lot of the tropes of the Gothic North in a very knowing way, but it also speaks back to this othering of the Gothic North, and I think it does so with quite a lot of humour. So the sort of standard features of the Gothic North that we find is a Gothic topography which um, both kind of reflects on the actual landscape itself and also encodes others of those details that we looked at earlier, which feed back into this conception of the North as an othered place, a land in this case, perhaps of blood um, and strife. So the sun had set in a dull red glow here and there around beds of rushes, wet and blood colored, disclosed the existence of a treacherous marsh. Um, so there's this sense of danger and the way in which the landscape is hostile. There's also this sense to a history of blood. Um, and I think this is a really interesting quote. There's no boundary betwixt the garden and the moor on the eastern side. The way in which this wild northern space has infected the domestic space as well. Um, that the human is not separate from the natural world here. That there's a, an untidy kind of crossover. Um, and cross-infection. Um, so uh, there's also sort of elements of the Gothic North and the Gothic anachronisms that we find in the landscape and the structures. So Wormsworth, who's the protagonist, passes a Druid circle, for example. So this tie back to an ancient sort of pagan past. Um, uh, we have one of the minor characters uh, appearing as a Catholic, crossing himself devoutly. Um, and then obviously we have the fact that the whole story is an anachronism. It's not from the current day, it's from the past. And these offer to all tell, he wrote in a low voice, at least there it stood. It's been ruins for more than a hundred years, said Mr. Marlowe, jammed his lady in the marsh through jealousy. So you have this uh, obvious attempt to reproduce dialect, but I'm not quite sure what dialect that is. Um, certainly not the West Yorkshire dialect. Um, uh, but you have, uh, obviously this sense of you know this is an event from the past but what is the connection between the present and the past the lines and comfortably blur in this northern space but what I think is really interesting about this is the main kind of crux of the story is a southern man not understanding the north a lot of things go wrong and a lot of things happen not because the, go the north is an inherently gothic space but because the southerner understands it as such. Let me demonstrate what I mean. Um, so Wormsworth knows nothing of the country. He admits it himself. I'm a stranger here. I know nothing. And so he tends to continue misinterpreting everything that's going on. So the mode of her garments perplexed him somewhat. Never before had he seen a woman gowned so strangely. And yet there was no doubt that what she wore became her vastly. The most important point, obviously. In some odd way, she reminded him of an 18th century painting of a bell of the Georgian court. So this very obvious, she is actually from the 18th century. <laughs> um, but he's just like, yeah, it's probably just like a northern thing, isn't it? They're weird up here. They're like really 
odd anachronistic people from the past, not as civilized, not as up to date as us, not as progressive. Um, and so you get this uh, sense in which it's his interference in this Gothic space, which causes the crisis. T looks on one figure pursuing the other because of his interactions in the scene. And Mr. Marlowe drowned his lady through jealousy, but the jealousy erupted because of him, this uh, modern Southern anachronism in a past space, um, potentially. Um, we, we also have uh, this sense of slippage for him as well. Curiously enough, the quaintness of their manners reflected itself upon him. He went unconsciously to mimic demeanor and speech. So he didn't, um, he didn't recognize this as anything but just northernness, but he also starts to slip into it. Um, and this northern space becomes a slippery space, um, but one which he disrupts and effectively breaks or ruins. So we've talked about the northern Gothic a little bit there, speaking back to the northern Gothic, how you get sort of a creation of a Gothic north from within, which I think differs from the othered Gothic North uh, that you find in sort of earlier Gothic examples. Um, and just a couple of examples of a Gothic North in more modern texts that uh, sort of show, I think, connections to this particular legacy. This investigation of uh, the Northern space as potentially, yes, inherently Gothic to some extent, but what does that Gothicness mean? And is that a negative? So you have, uh, you know, this uh, concentration on the moorland landscapes quite frequently. You have this concentration on the north as a different space. You have this concentration frequently on uh, questions of class and inheritance from that sort of industrial Gothic. Um, but here are just three examples that I plucked out as maybe uh, interesting or useful. Catherine Cookson's The Moth, which I've made people watch with me, which is set in the north of England. Um, is a sort of gothic romance from a working class working man's perspective. Um, Happy Valley is actually set in the valley where I live. If you've not seen it, it's a really dark gothic -y crime drama. Um, and obviously The League of Gentlemen, which is set uh, up and around where I live as well. Um, but uh, I think it's an interesting question to discuss sort of, are these Northern Gothic texts? And if so, are they Gothicizing the North? Are they othering the North? Or are they writing from within the North and sort of having a more nuanced and balanced kind of exploration of the, the North as a potentially Gothic space and whether that Gothic can be positive in some way. So these are the questions that we can discuss. We can also discuss anything else you like. Um, but for those of you who have been joining us just for the video, thanks for joining us. You can discuss these questions at home and feel free to contact me on Twitter at Ron Sam. So how would you define the Northern Gothic? How do you understand it? What are its limitations? Um, what are the limits of what we call the Northern Gothic? Is it a useful term? Um, has the Northern Gothic, do you think, changed over time? Is there a core of continued concerns if you're looking at examples that you might consider to be Northern Gothic? And what text do you know that you would consider Northern Gothic?